Welcome back to another episode of Cobra Kai Companion. I am Peter. I am Brianna. And today we have some very special guests. Uh, you guys know them as the big three, but currently we have John Horowitz and Josh Hield joining us today. How are you guys doing? We're great. Very good. The big three minus one. Big three minus yes. one for now. Yeah, hopefully. For now. We'll, we'll see if Hayden decides to make an entrance. Uh, you know, he's caught up right now. From uh, I, He, he yeah. probably thinks that he's too big for us now. You know, it's... Is, is the move to Netflix. He's, trying to, he, he's he, trying to do an offshoot of the big one, but you know. <laughs> well, he did large, try to start that. Two. Right. He did try to start that top dog thing. Oh, right. nothing is lamer than the top dog. That's not, that's, that's total BS. Yeah. No, that, there's no traction there. Yeah. It's not going to work. Well, I mean, we'll just kind of uh, jump right into it and let's get some uh, very important questions out of the way uh, right away. Season four, what, what can you tell us about uh, release dates, trailers, teasers, anything about season four? Nothing. Yeah, we can't tell you anything. Um, not going to tell you anything. Um, and um, I guess that's the end of the interview. It's been nice seeing you guys. <laughs> no, sure it, it. It's, it's so funny. I, you know, obviously, you know, we, we wish we could, uh, you know, say everything. Sometimes it's because we don't know yet because some, uh, you know, when you're dealing with a you know a company like Netflix, or even when we were with YouTube, uh, there's so many elements that go into the decision making for like release dates and when trailers are coming out and all that stuff. That's beyond just us wanting the you know the images out in the world and wanting the info out there. You know we we always want the fans to get as much as they can as possible, but there's a whole process for everything. So uh, we we can say that you will get the show. And uh, I think we're confident that you will get it in quarter four this year because, you know, the, the head honcho at Netflix says put that out into the ether. Now, that could always change, but our, our, uh, everything we're John, nothing's ever changed before. I mean, I feel no, like no, it's true. Never. And John's never owned, like, a, you know, a, a date or a time period before. So I, I would just say, like, take a big swing here, John, and, and let's, yeah. you know, let it have so, your name attached to it and... Should I just give? I, I didn't say me. It's Ted Sarandos' name is attached to it. I said I'm tr I'm, I'm trusting what I, I, he I'm, said. I'm talking but... about the season three. Uh, oh, debacle. I know. <laughs> yeah, well, that was that was you know again you're getting you're getting information you're being told definitive things from people and then they turn out to not be definitive. But none this of that's why stuff I don't uh, I don't engage with anybody about anything really because mm -hmm. I find if I just stay out of everything you know creative wise marketing wise, stage wise, I'm just surprised. I, at some point I'll turn on Netflix. I'll, oh, there it is. It's uh, how long has it been out? Months, months. I can't wait for Josh to see season four, what we did. Right. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. You know, I mean, it's, uh, I hope it delivers on the premise of uh, where we left off. In season, three. In season three, right, Josh? Is that the one with the school fight? Yeah, yeah, that's that. Yeah, one. no, I've seen that. That was good. The, um, uh, the um, Cor Corey, and Sam, yeah, they, uh -huh. they had that uh, that big fight. It was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Corey, uh, Corey uh, Mills, right? Yeah, Corey, yeah, yeah. Corey Schwarber. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. um, I I do think though that we went through so much with season three that um, there's really nothing you could say or do that would be any worse <laughs> than anything we've already been through. Weeks, April. Um, September, January 8th, we don't know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it, was, it, was the it. it was the worst. That was just the worst for everybody involved. I, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a fan base, as a, in our position to have completed the season of the show that we were super proud of and that we were dying for everybody to see, to be in such limbo. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think, uh, you know, it all happened for a reason. We all ended up in, in, a, in a better place, uh, you know, with a lot more people getting to enjoy the show and a, and a path forward because there was no path forward. Yeah. And, and I can assure you guys and the fandom that there is a, a cohesive, you know, strong plan for when uh, and how things will show up, what, you know, in terms of when you'll see a teaser, when you'll see a trailer, when you'll see the show. Um, there, there will be real dates. Um, you know, we, you know, we know some stuff that we, we can't, uh, we can't divulge, um, at this, at this stage, but, right. um, it's, it's, we're not living in a world of complete uncertainty and 
at the whim of a pandemic and you know switching corporations. There is a a actual path uh, toward yeah. uh, you know toward season four. So at the very least, it's better for us right now. Like yes. we're at least we at least have some certainty. Um, you guys won't know anything. No, uh, you know, but at and least they never we, will. We, but you know, that's <laughs> that's just that, we'll just that turn on the, the TV plan. one day and there it is. Oh my it's god, exciting guys! I'm telling you, yeah. But we can we can we can tell you that at least like you know we're not sharing in the misery at the, at the moment uh, because we we know that it is coming out and we know that there is a plan in place and we know that there's a lot of people putting a lot of thought into it. Um, you know, I know that there's there are moments where you know the the fan base uh, expects something and then it doesn't happen and then um, you know there's frustrations and all that stuff and that's I think that's what we love about the fans is that they're everyone's so so eager and excited and wants, you know, wants to, to know more. And, uh, you know, we're here always wanting to give more and uh, you will, there's, there's some fun stuff coming up. There's some fun stuff. Yeah, I, I guess I, I, one of the first questions I have, um, because the last time we guys spoke with you was um, the day you guys made the announcement of the move to Netflix. Uh, now being on Netflix, uh, how has that changed? Do you guys have more flexibility with anything? Uh, has has things been more advantageous uh, now under the umbrella of Netflix? I'll say it's been you know pretty much business as usual. You know you're you're dealing with a much bigger machine um, that is you know wholly focused on uh, content, whereas you know at, at YouTube uh, Premium you, we were dealing with a little bit of a disconnect uh, between you know Google's path forward into you know the entertainment space and YouTube's desires. Um, so it's you know nothing is ever apples to apples. There are some things where you know there's more hands off. There are some things where it's more hands on, um, but the what we feel in, in the path of you know pre production and production and post production will never be felt in the show itself. You know, there are just you know different, as you know, with different organizations and um, different personnel, you have you know different ways of arriving at uh, at the same result sometimes. But it's. Uh, it's a well-oiled machine, you know, the show, and it's a well-oiled machine, Netflix, and it's it's really a great marriage between the two. Yeah, I would. One thing I would just add is that there, there's so many more people uh, working within Netflix. They just the departments have a lot more. There's a lot more resources in terms of like when it comes to say marketing and publicity and, um, you know, uh, that that side of the business where. You know, at YouTube, there was really talented people who'd come up with great ideas and there would just be either no money for it or there'd be, you know, no, there was no time or there was no infrastructure to like get some of these great ideas done. Whereas at Netflix, you know, there's a, 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 a large team of really talented individuals who are putting a lot of thought into it and doing some pretty involved things. Um, and you see, you know, they're very communicative with us. Um, and you see um, things come together quickly and you see uh, uh, that, that there's a lot planned. And we felt it in the releases of, you know, when seasons one and two and then eventually season three, all that felt really good. But now we're in our first year where we've actually made a season with them and carrying it all the way through. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's certainly a, a whole other level. Um, hearkening back to that conversation, the last time that we um, were honored enough to talk to you, it was a big day. Um, when we were talking about the exposure that you would be getting with the move to Netflix, uh, someone, I wish I could remember who, said that you would be as big as Stranger Things. And the three of you were like, nah, 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 we're never going to be that big. I can't remember who said that. Anyway, <laughs> come September, you know, and and season one and one and two dropped, and you started holding records, streaming records, you know, all the way through September, and then you did it again in January. What? I mean, you always knew that that was what you had, but what did it feel like to see the rest of the world realize it? It felt really good and validating that, you know, we knew that there was this fandom there that was as big as Marvel and Star Wars in our minds. And because there's so much overlap, it's not saying it's a separate group of people. It's, it's you know, largely, you know, the, the, the same people and then some. 
Um, so we, we knew that getting this show on the biggest platform in the world would have an effect. Now, you know, you hope that it catches fire. You hope that, you know, people have the same passion for it uh, that, that our original, you know, fandom did on uh, YouTube Premium now that it, you know, is exposed to such a larger uh, fan base. Um, but there's no guarantees. But it was, it was magical just to see it, you know, take hold and to see it, you know, reach number one in all these countries. And the fact that Netflix actually released, you know, some of its data in terms of its performance was very telling, um, you know, for a company that doesn't do that unless there's really something to, uh, to boast about. Um, so it, it was really thrilling for us to, to feel what we, we felt the first time around in, in 2018. But, you know, it was like another shot of that, you know, that adrenaline, that dopamine, and it was, but it was so much more intense. It was, it was a, a second high uh, of, with the same feels of the first one where you're, you're feeling the love and you're feeling the, the appreciation from that's just echoing a lot louder and a lot more robustly. Yeah, I'd say one thing that was really unique and special to the Netflix experience was the amount of family viewing has been has gone through the roof and that's one of those things that you know I, I think you know a lot fewer people watch youtube on their televisions whereas netflix everybody watches on their televisions so what we you know when we've been you know had our conversations with the team at netflix um and you know it's been documented in you know some of the press as well is you know you see the numbers of the amount of accounts that are watching our show but more so than other shows it's a couple watching it together or an entire family watching it together or a parent and a child or whatever it is. So while our numbers are, are very large when it comes to just the, the accounts themselves, the, the, the fact that there's so much family viewing and couples viewing and um, you feel that not just, you know, in the data, but you also feel it in life. Um, you know, I could say as, as somebody who, you know, has, uh, has two kids, Josh has three kids, um, you know, we're, we're family guys. And when we were on YouTube, it was rare that anyone that we're interacting with in our sort of, you know, personal lives really watched the show. You would, you would hear, you know, you know, the occasional person and they were passionate like you guys are about the show, but it's, it's been a completely different experience since the move to Netflix where, you know, I, I, I coach, uh, I'm one of the assistant coaches on uh, my daughter's little league teams. Uh, and, uh, you know, now it's the kind of thing where, and if I'm wearing my Cobra Kai hat, like I am right now, uh, there, and, and it becomes clear that like, I am one of the people who makes the show, the enthusiasm that say, I, you know, feel on the internet or feel from you guys, you're feeling just in everyday life. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's really special and to have children love the show and see the, see the family connection has really been a, a whole awesome thing that's been going on. I thought that was a really interesting comment you made, John. Um, I, I believe it was the, the article um, you shared yesterday with the em Emmys. You mentioned that, yeah, the people in our everyday lives wasn't, wasn't watching the show yet. And I'm thinking back to when I got my first vaccination, I was wearing an Eagle Fang shirt and oh my God, like the amount of comments I was getting on the shirt and not even about my vaccination. People were just like, Eagle Fang, you know, like, like everybody had just watched the show. So uh, yeah, it's, it's really cool to see like more people recognizing like, uh, you know, the clothing that we wear. But your, two, your point about Eagle Fang, it's so funny. Um, you know, while we were in production on, on season four, um, we had like a little break in the day where we were shooting some stuff during the day and then we had to wait for uh, the sun to go down. So we had, uh, you know, an, a little hour in between and Josh and I um, stepped aside to uh, grab a drink in, in a restaurant, uh, uh, you know, get away, get away from the set for a few minutes. And we walk into this bar area and we see two men uh, who it turned out they were like, you know, uh, one of them had just turned 59. He's a military veteran um, and he's wearing an Eagle Fang shirt and he sees me, I'm wearing a Cobra Kai shirt. And he sees me, he's like, are you Cobra Kai? And I'm like, yeah, I'm Cobra Kai. But like, I wasn't sure if he knew like what was going on and he saw my sweatshirt. And then he's like, uh, and then, we, you know, we were talking about how we were filming nearby and 
he's uh, he's like, I just got this shirt for my birthday. And then his buddy walks in and his brother, his buddy's also wearing an Eagle Fang shirt, the same exact shirt. And then he, that guy tells me the whole story about how he couldn't, how, you know, the, the site was down and he wasn't able to get the shirt. So he had to like buy it from overseas. <laughs> and it was like this whole, this whole kind of crazy thing. So for us, when we, when we're in the wild and you see somebody wearing an Eagle Fang shirt, like people experience with you and you were getting your vaccine. It's, yeah. uh, it's wild. It's wild. Yeah. Unfortunately, you will never experience me in the wild wearing Eagle Fang because I refuse to buy it. You won't, you won't get it. So, it's so dumb. It's so dumb. <laughs> it's the greatest thing ever. Well, what if Daniel was rocking an Eagle Fang shirt? Would we then see you with one? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> there, there we go. <laughs> never say never. <laughs> just, put, just put one on Daniel and then I'll, yeah, then I'll buy it. <laughs> Um, so with the Emmys, um, I, I, nominations have not been revealed yet, but voting wrapped up uh, Sunday, was it? Um, Sunday or Monday. Yeah. yeah. It, you got a lot of pushback, particularly from fans. Um, when we found out that you were pushing for comedy and you used probably the least comedic episode you've ever written as your entry, um, so is there, I mean, what is the inclination here? Are we moving toward a drama? Are we going to stay comedy? Is that, you know, juicy, the funny core coming back? Um, uh, be you... because of the, the time of that the show runs, um, and because of the pattern that the show is made under, with it just it falls under these, you know, one of these two categories, either drama or comedy. And you know, as as we all know, television has been blurring those lines a little bit. Cobra Kai is a chief example among, you know, those shows that skew closer to a half hour, yet aren't, you know, Three's Company or, mm -hmm. you know, different strokes, you know, to use two examples from 500 years ago. Um, but so we will always be classified as a comedy um, and that will be, you know, to the, to the benefit of, or detriment of the show and when voting comes around, you know, it's when you look at half hour comedies, you know, that um, are in that Emmy discussion over the last, you know, few years, you start to see more, you know, bleed in that have a little bit more, um, drama in them um or at least a little bit more you know social issues and um and it's not just going for joke 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 and it's not a multi-cam sitcom but i still think we are in those you know those early days where you know you have voters who are choosing between drama and comedy and at a show like cobra kai doesn't scream you know comedy and yet it's not as as long and as robust as uh, some dramas so we do fall a little bit between those two. Um, you know, we don't classify the show in our in our heads um, as here comes a, a raucous comedy. Um, and, you know, I don't think it'll ever be marketed as such. Um, but that's just because of, you know, the, the TV Academy has those categories. Um, and it, you know, you end up having a little bit of a, a square peg with roundish corners that's trying to fit into a triangle hole. Mm -hmm. I, I'll say that, like, you know, I, one of the things that I love about Cobra Kai is that it's all things, that it is, it is a comedy, and it is a drama, and, you know, it is an action show, and it's a coming of age story, and it's, uh, you know, there, there's, there's so much to the show, you know, our, our writer's room is full of comedy writers, like, literally everyone in that room came through the comedy space, and I'll say that most scenes, when we're writing them, we are looking for some comedic element to them, you know, whether it's a light, light moment here or there. Um, and, you know, when you do look back at the series as a whole, you can find a ton of laughs and you can find a ton of comedy throughout. Um, so it is one of those things, as Josh said, that it's kind of a little bit of everything. And, you know, if you're a certain kind of Emmy voter and you're looking for comedies and you're watching um, different kinds of shows and you're, uh, you know, we're not going to be considered a comedy to a lot of people and it may be to our detriment in certain, in certain ways. And that's fine. Um, in terms of, you know, picking, uh, that, uh, that particular episode at the end of the day, I think it was, you know, you're trying to put your best foot forward with the best episode that you have mm -hmm. of the series. I think that, you know, by and large, you know, the, when, 
when you look online and when people are rating episodes and things like that, that episode is is beloved and we love that episode. It's like and a 9.7 it, on IMDb it, or it, something. It, it, yeah, it's like an insane number. So, you know, our thing is, you know, at the end of the day, we happen to have a show that frankly, it's it's good now. A lot of people have actually seen it so they could make their own judgment and they're not really judging it off of say episode 10. They're, up, they're, they're seeing Cobra Kai and they're like not thinking, okay, well this episode or that probably if you're just a regular voter, you're probably just thinking, oh, okay, this episode of Cobra Kai, I'll get, I, I, that's a good episode of Cobra Kai and it's in the comedy category, so maybe I'll vote for it. I think that's sort of just sort of the headspace with it. Um, I know that there are other episodes that I could think of uh, from, from season three that are skew more comedy. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we'll see what even happens. Like, you know, where we, we love how there's Emmy talk about it. We're most proud of just sort of like, we have such a hardworking cast and crew that we'd love to see people get recognized for their work. They do such a great job and bring so much joy to so many people. So if, if any of our actors get nominated, if any, uh, you know, we have, uh, we were eligible in so many different categories. If anyone nabs a nomination, we're, we're, we're out there champion, championing everybody and, and we're cheerleading and, you know, if it happens, great. If it doesn't happen, that's fine too. You know, uh, we're we're happy enough with people just enjoying the show. Yeah, um, kind of what you guys are talking about, like the the uh, the runtime for for the episodes in season three. Um, the runtimes were a little bit longer, but we also got uh, uh, you know this other story uh, in flashbacks with uh, Crees in Vietnam and and things like that. Um, and it being a roughly 30, 40 minutes an episode, you guys find it challenging to kind of figure out who's going to get what dialogue like during the plot A or in, in what's going on in, in plot B? Like, how do you guys find, and, and also with season four with, uh, you know, some of the announcements of, of like new characters, how do you guys figure out how to balance like who gets what dialogue and, and scenes? It's a big puzzle, you know, we, and then the puzzle gets more complex every year, you know, in season one, the puzzle had these huge giant pieces and it was obvious, you know, which ones went where, um, by season four, like you said, we have so many characters now and so many storylines that are, that are in flux, um, that it becomes, you know, it, it's, it's moved on from a little bit of a few friends playing music together to an orchestra that you're conducting and you need to know you know, when to hear the strings and when to hear the brass. And, you know, that that really happens organically um, amongst our process, um, you know, without the rest of the writers. And then once we begin the writer's room, um, you you find those big storylines, those big macro arcs that you're going to be uh, diving into. Um, and then you start to feel, okay, what are the micro moments and the, you know, the machinations that, that get you there? Um, some of those require a check-in every single episode. Some of those feel like they can be in the background, uh, you know, for an episode and they're still happening off camera and you're not going to lose track of that story if it stands down for a while. And you feel it. It's, um, you know, there's, there's usually an urgency with, you know, an A plot or a B plot in terms of what's taking up, you know, the, what you're leading with, what the cold open is you know, telling you to, is going to be significant in, in a given episode. Um, and then it's, it's a matter of, okay, if we are fading somebody and they're a little blurry in the background for an episode, you know, how can we bring that storyline more to the forefront um, in the following episode? So, so you do feel, you know, everything is still happening, um, but it, it's like, it's a recipe, you know, you're, you're, you're baking, you're tasting, you're saying, Oh, we're not feeling enough of this. Oh, it's been, you know, 10 minutes without this storyline. Um, and, and those are things that as the, you know, outline process happens, as the scripts happen, even in editorial after we film something, you know, you're feeling, uh, you know, I'm losing track of this headspace. I'm losing track of this storyline. You know, how can we engineer or rearrange a scene um, to make sure that it, it, it feels perfect. So it's, it's something we're hyper aware of, but it, it has gotten uh, more complex as the seasons go on. Uh, when it comes to like the the crafting, especially the editing on episode ten on December nineteenth, um, the fight at the end where you've got you know the flashback going, and it, we see that Crease was a murderer right before he straight up tries to murder both Johnny and Daniel. 
was there any, like, how did you, how did you write that? Did you write that back and forth or did you write that as two separate pieces that just got put together in the end? That was, that was written. That was something that we talked about in the writer's room and Bob Dearden, who wrote that episode, who's a fantastic writer on our show. We absolutely love him. Uh, he's become really a maestro of those kinds of moments. Like when there's a, uh, a montage that it, whenever we always find it, whenever it's one of his episodes that has those kind of interweaving kind of whether it's, you know, an around the world kind of situation or whether it was something like that fight. Um, you know, his first draft usually comes in with a really strong version of that. And, you know, we may make adjustments to it for, for, uh, here or there, um, you know, as we're getting closer to production or as we're sort of, you know, finding, um, you know, final form. But uh, it's it's in the writing process. So, you know, when you're doing something that um, with there was that there was a lot of in intent there, like you said, um, you know, we wanted to be really making the audience feel like anything could happen in this fight given what happened in the past um is is you know uh is the past gonna have is history gonna repeat itself in certain ways or in a new in a, in a new way um you know will johnny kill crease will crease kill johnny will daniel kill crease or vice versa um it's uh it's it's things that got a little out of control Yes. Well, we, and we and we filmed it with that intent. Also, we really locked ourselves into that kind of pacing, where you know, as Johnny is you know beating up Crease, there was an intent with what hand he's punching with, um, so we can cut to Captain Turner, you know, punching Crease with the exact same you know counter move. Um, so it's like it's like a right left, you know, a right in the present day, a left in the past. Um, and you know, likewise, you know, when we cut from the past to the present, um, so that everything we did on the bridge and everything we did in the dojo was precisely choreographed to only work out in in the way it worked out editorially. Uh, on the um, talk of, uh, topic of Bob Dearden, who is a, a new writer in season three, um, shout out to Prati and uh, Joshua, who also worked with him at uh, I, I Zombie. Was that the yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so Bob, he wrote Miyagi Do episode 305. Uh, how did you guys decide Bob, uh, a new, uh, new writer, is going to get an episode like Miyagi Do that has so much history from the, the Karate Kid movies? Um, you know, that specific episode. I think we, we've, we you know what it was. I think we, we found the from the beginning, uh, first of all, he was he became highly recommended from the showrunner of I Zombie. Um, you know, uh, uh, Rob Thomas, um, the showrunner, is uh, uh, reached out to us. Um, this was before the show was on Netflix, obviously, because it was pre season three. Uh, he reached just out to us out of the blue to tell us what a huge fan of Cobra Kai he was, and just like really thought it was a special show. And when we were staffing up. We were looking at writers and we ended up giving him a ring and, you know, seeing if he had anybody. And, you know, Bob Dearden was not on our radar. And he's like, this guy is a special writer and he's great for me on my shows, but the kinds of shows he should be writing are your shows. He should be writing on Cobra Kai. That's what his sweet spot is. And we met with him. We loved him. Uh, he's, he's like a kind of a, uh, a, a quiet Canadian guy in certain ways. He's so humble and all this stuff, but he's got a hilarious sense of humor. And, it, and as we've gotten to know him more and more and more of it comes out. But it was one of those things where you felt early on in the room that he, every time he opened his mouth, something very smart and insightful was coming out. And it just sort of fell into the place where we also know that, you know, we do a lot of rewriting of the episodes ourselves. So it almost doesn't matter in a certain way, like who's writing the first draft at times, but we're like, okay, let's give him a shot because he feels like he could deliver pretty well. And every script that he's written for us, it comes in really strong. We have, like, as, as we said, we've had to make adjustments here and there, uh, just, you know, the nature of the beast as, as, you know, the 10 episodes are all kind of, you know, coming into, into focus and we're getting closer to production and things like that. But his episodes always come in strong. And so when he wrote, 305 so well we gave him the finale as well because we were like this guy is delivering at a very high level and we did the same thing um 
you know, he's, he's, he's had some, he has some important episodes in season four as well. I, I guess a, a quick follow-up to that, because also in 305, we get uh, Amanda slapping Crease. Was that already part of the outline or was that like a suggestion by him? Everything is part of the outline. I think when it comes down to it, that, you know, that, that, that's, that, that's the thing, you know, when, when it says that, you know, we wrote an episode or somebody else wrote an episode of the show, it's really a collective discussion within the room and the scenes are in pretty clear focus. Um, it, even, you know, there's jokes pitched that end up that are from the room that end up in the script. So, you know, every individual writer certainly brings their own flair and their own stuff to the table, but the intent of every scene is, is outlined beforehand and the shape of every scene and like what is going on emotionally in the headspace of every single character and the specific action of what's going on and, and, and pieces of the comedy, you know, all of that happens in outline form before a writer tackles the script. Um, I know I, it, we, we only have a limited amount of time, but haven't talked to you guys in forever, have a million questions and want to keep them serious, but one that's not serious at all, but I really want to know, why did you guys spend so much time picking Daniel up and chucking him around this season? Like people just picked him up and threw him everywhere. What, what, what is that? Is well, it, you know, he weighs, you know, he weighs like 95 pounds soaking wet. So it's, you know, it's easy just to kind of, you know, just, just toss him to and fro. Um, it makes it all no, the more I mean, impressive. I, it makes it impressive when he takes these guys down. Yeah. I think you have to, you know, you have to bat somebody around a little bit to, to continue to earn that underdog quality. You know, Daniel is such an overdog now, you know, he's, he's achieved uh, and he's, you know, he's been the, the David versus the Goliath so many times that, you know, you, you are always looking for ways of, of challenging a character like that, um, you know, physically and mentally to be able to continue to put them in a place where they have um, as much, you know, rootability and as much uh, of a mountain to climb as possible to make them overcoming that obstacle, um, you know, really, really enjoyable. That is mm. a very serious answer for a very silly question. Thank you for making no. that serious. <laughs> I, I thought it was a great question, actually. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, Josh, you were, um, you had an interview, I, I believe, is it Sarah O'Connor or Connell? Sarah O'Connell, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, you mentioned that you guys like to use the um, the viewers' like expectations against them. Uh, and in season three, we had a lot of uh, uh, swerves. I don't know what you want to call them, but uh, for example, the- In the uh, 90s, it was psych. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but uh, in episode three, we get this bit of uh, this tease: uh, is this, this doctor? Is it Ali? Is it not? You know, this is Elizabeth Shue. Can you talk about? Um, let's just talk about the legacy characters. And like, you guys mentioned this outline. We hear you guys like in Q and As and in some interviews that, you know, seasons uh, season. You guys have like an outline up to like season six or. Um, I might be, you know, misphrasing it, but like, how do you guys plan to write these storylines and like how far in advance do you have to try to even get, uh, get a hold of these legacy actors to come back and play these roles? It, it varies. You know, we, we have a, a long-term view. Um, you know, we, we know where we're going. We've, you know, made no secret of, uh, of that. Um, the, but, but the ins and outs of, of legacy characters. Um, there are, there are a lot of ways to skin a cat. You can, you know, there are, there are branches and paths that you can take that, you know, arrive you at the same place. So there are moments that we are discovering um, and inventing new ways to, uh, to bring characters uh, into the show who have been in the franchise before and to introduce new characters that, you know, perhaps um, are introduced, you know, by proxy um, or characters that have no connection to anyone um, in the franchise, and and those are those are all interesting tools to use to continue to tell, you know, the story and and, and the the beating heart of where we're going. Um, some of those discussions happen, you know, more than a year before you know a character uh, or a performer might come back and uh, and be on set with us. Some of them have happened literal days or a week, you know, before, um, and it and it really goes comes down to um, 
you know, sometimes the availability of somebody, sometimes how fast the storyline is coming together or changing. Um, and sometimes it's, um, it's the laborious nature of, of deal making um, or, or accommodating somebody's schedule. So there, there are lots of factors that come into it. We always, you know, try to, you know, to reach out to, um, you know, to a lot of the, the performers who have been on the show and some of whom who haven't just to, you know, introduce ourselves and make ourselves known, um, you know, to, to people, you know, some of whom haven't acted in uh, a very long time, uh, just to start dialogues, whether, you know, whether they go someplace or not. Um, so that's been really enjoyable for us just to, you know, to cultivate these relationships and to, you know, to go into our writing space with each other and to try to really, like you said, use, use the fans expectations, not against them, but challenge, you know, the fans to be surprised, you know, audiences are so savvy, you know, they, they just really are. They, they smell stuff coming, they predict things. Um, the deeper you get into storytelling, um, the, the narrower the, the tunnel becomes and it, it's harder to, to outflank um, expectations, but we will continue to strive to do that um, and, some of these tools, these legacy characters are, are interesting weapons for us to, to wield um, to that regard. What was that? That was like the strangest looking motion ever. Did you guys see that? <laughs> what, John? <laughs> yeah, you were, you oh. were like, yeah, you looked like I a bobblehead. I, I was moving, I was moving my, uh, my laptop. Oh, okay, okay. Um, well, uh, following up on the legacy characters question, I guess I will deal with the elephant in the room who we know is is coming back um and again since you guys said you, you know you know this story so far in advance you know the six years you've been listening to the fandom scream bloody murder since day one we want terry silver we want terry silver have you known the entire time when and how he was coming back we absolutely knew that we were going to bring terry silver back and we had a sense of kind of the rhythms in which we would get there. We loved doing season three, how we did to introduce Terry Silver back into the world in a very unpredictable way. And even within that, you talk about the swerves that we had, having one character who you think must be Terry Silver and then having that character be one of the characters who got killed that season. Right. Um, and uh, well, that's not I, Terry. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's not Terry. And then right after that, you're everyone's dealing with the shock of that. But then you, it's like, you know, you know, uh, he gets yelled at and you care who, who silver is in that moment if you're paying attention. Um, and uh, so we loved the idea of bringing Terry back first through flashback. Um, we thought it would be great because it helped uh, deepen uh, Crease's story, but also deepens Terry's story so that when we're bringing him into the world of this show, people who are not as familiar with Karate Kid 3 um, have the, the, uh, a level of information that we think was important for present day Terry to be entering the world with. So we know who this man was pre-Karate Kid 3, and we know what he's like in Karate Kid 3. And uh, so that when we bring him into the story now, uh, there's such a, there's an even richer kind of legacy to the character. Um, and uh, we had, you know, in terms of like, you know, our communication with him, um, you know, we didn't know for sure that he would want to be back. But, you know, once the show, you know, was out there and, and um, you know, people were liking it in general, you would hear a little bit through the grapevine here or there that, you know, this person or that person, you know, would be interested whether they directly reached out to us or not. Uh, but there was enough sort of like positive little, uh, even just like on social media, like little things back and forth, like uh, like liking a certain tweet or something like that to see that, okay, you know, Thomas Ian Griffith's engaged with the fandom. He's aware of what's happening here. Mary and Page every Keller was tagging a lot of stuff, Terry Silver too, for a while. Yeah, and, and what I will say is, um, you know, we become close with Robert Kamen and Robert from the beginning has said, this guy's the best. He's like, he's like Thomas Ian Griffith. He's like, he's like a true martial artist. He's, he is a force of nature, but he's also a brilliant man. I mean, this is a guy who's become a successful screenwriter. 
he uh, he's an opera singer. He's a pianist. He's uh, you know he he can kind of do it all. He's a true Renaissance man. Um, and uh, so uh, having the opportunity to to bring him back uh, and in the way that we that we have and we're dying for you to see um, is is really really going to be special. Just kind of thinking back to the teaser and and showing us uh, Terry Silver, did that have anything to do with like, well, I mean, we're already setting it up, so we're just going to use that, or was that just just the I, I don't know, the kind of the obvious choice to to give us in a teaser? I think it was just you know we are where we're at in terms of um, having completed production of season four. Um, and, you know, there's still a, you know, a period of time in which you're in post-production and you, you have certain assets that exist and you have certain assets that are still coming together. And they, you know, there was a desire to do, um, you know, casting announcements um, for, you know, for some new faces that are coming to the season. And this one really earned the, a little bit more than a casting announcement. How do you how do you put a little bit of uh, of a shine on something that would otherwise just be a press release when you have a you know a legacy character coming back? And we hadn't done that yet. You know, every every time we've had a legacy character return to the to the franchise, it's been a complete secret. Um, mm -hmm. So this was also kind of playing with the fandom's expectations that you know that we would never do this. Um, it's fun to just kind of say here he comes and and let you deal with the with what that nightmare nightmare might mean. Oh, I think I think I would just add on top of that that we this, we felt like we set it up pretty clearly at the end of season three that mm -hmm. you know that call was to Terry Silver, and we could either have everybody wait the whole time to figure out is he going to come back or not. But we thought we were pretty pretty we were tipping the hand pretty strongly. And it was such, it was a different kind of move. We love the idea. We said early on, it's funny because we were amongst us, we're talking and we're like, we love the idea of there being like a Joker like teaser trailer that it's like, let's treat Terry Silver, this character from, you know, Karate Kid 3, who was very memorable and real and has fans love, but like that movie isn't beloved by everybody. It's not a, uh, you know, uh, you know, it, uh, respected at the level of say the first film or the second film. And for us and for our fandom and for our story, we think that this is a big deal. We think that this is a, like, his character was so larger than life and so over the top that he warranted that sort of, you know, super villain kind of treatment, especially with where we're at with the, with the fan base all over the world. Let's do something big and splashy with that character. And we love the idea of, from the beginning of not showing his face, but showing that, you know, that ponytail. Um, and, uh, and Netflix, independent of us having that idea, also had that idea. They felt the same way, given all the creative that they were hearing, uh, you know, with our plans for the show. So even while we were still making this, making the show, the, there was talk of this kind of a thing happening. Um, I have to admit, to, you know, speaking about what you've set up and where you left us at the end of season three, and the expectation. Yes, of course, everyone knew that that was Terry. Um, even though some of us were like, well, you know, he could have called anyone. And then mm -hmm. um, some of us tried to run interference for Robert mm -hmm. Mark Kamen opening his big mouth oh, yes, three times. Yes. Of course, <laughs> of course. Um, and you know, it could be, but you have pushed the pacifist to the point of murder with his worst enemy's blessing. And now you're bringing like the worst bad guy in the entire franchise back. Um, so I'm just going to straight up say I'm terrified what's what's coming. I, I, I can't wait to see it. But because there is so much darkness to play with in that third movie, if you lean into it, I'm absolutely terrified of what's going to happen to these characters that I love so much. I know they'll end up OK in the end because I trust you guys, but you're going to destroy us before we get there, aren't you? Of course. Yeah. Just have to wait and see. <laughs> <laughs> well, every season has destroyed us a little bit more. Yeah. Um, by the time we get to the end, we're just going to be puddles of goo in front of the TV. 
uh, how how are you guys doing on time? Just so I I know what kind of um, questions. I think I think we could probably talk another ten minutes or so because I know we got delayed because of Hayden, who is okay. not going to be joining us. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So uh, what I wanted to touch on was um, kind of back to three hundred four and three hundred five with uh, Daniel going to Okinawa and you know having Tamlin, Yuji, and Tracy. Even can you guys talk about like um, you know. Uh, coming up with the, I, I, I guess the, the, just kind of bringing them back into the story and having Tommy Village be like the shopping mall, just all the different changes in having their characters return to, um, to have some sort of impact and help Daniel find balance. Yeah, well, we wanted to be honest to the progress of time, you know, at, well, so, so not saying that look at Tommy Village just exactly as you remember it from um, Karate Kid Part 2. But also in Karate Kid Part 2, there was a passage of time from the last time, you know, Miyagi was there, you know, and he shows up on the, the wrong end of the, uh, you know, where he thought the village used to be. And, oh, no, it moved down there. Um, and there was a military base. Um, so, you know, we knew that um, that Okinawa in general, you know, right now is is does not look like Tommy Village looked um, in uh, in the movie, so we wanted to be honest um, to to that experience and also play the comedic you know result of that. But what if you know what if you went to this sacred place you know with the best intentions and the and the Miyagi feels and there's a Jersey Mike's there you know there's something that's a gut punch about that um, that's also hilarious. Um, but then you discover the magic is not in the the structures in themselves, it's the people. Um, so you immediately salve that wound with, um, you know, the reintroduction of, of Kumiko and, and you end up on this path of personal discovery as opposed to, hey, remember this place and this is what it felt like um, to see this structure. Um, so, so that was really fun to, to kind of pull the rug and then, and then guide the story down a much more introspective path um, you know, the, the letter writing scene was something, you know, we talked about, um, extensively in the writer's room and, uh, and I thought Michael Jonathan Smith did a great job of achieving that in the script. Oh, yeah. Um, you yeah. know, really giving you a new type of, you know, Miyagi flashback, a new, you know, story to add to the, to the canon, um, without needing to use flashbacks and dailies from the movies to tell that story. Um, and, and then getting to the, to the Tracy Gucci part of it, it was okay. Like, can we pull this off? You know, that Daniel did this great, you know, heroic, wonderful deed that he put out into the universe. Um, and he was brave enough and he was strong enough and he was selfless enough to do that. Um, it, it was the perfect opportunity to, to say that, you know, that life does come full circle and, you know, putting good out into the universe, you know, brings good back. Um, and we felt like it would be like a nice little cherry on top of that Sunday of at the end of this whole experience where he's kind of come to terms um, with the fact that his business might be ruined, but he's had, you know, his heart full of everything else that was missing um, to say, you're going to get that too. That, that thing that you thought was the problem that you've now kind of let go and you've you know given up given up to the universe because there's this other kind of goodness well because you've been able to do that you get this too oh i like that idea um uh, speaking kind of along those lines um i know that uh you guys have spoken and i believe tamlin has too that she kind of gently corrected some of your okinawan phrasing and um and you know, gave different uh, consultation on the culture and and things like that. Um, with the PTSD storylines, with Daniel and Sam both, and the way they're interweaving, and him dealing with thirty five year old trauma, and her dealing with you know five month old trauma. Did you have someone consult on that, or was that all? Because it's very ridiculously painfully realistic the PTSD storylines, very, very well done. You know, we, we, we actually didn't have anybody um, consulting on it, but it was one of those things that, you know, you know, when you have a room full of people who are writing a show, 
Um, everybody brings their own personal experiences to the table in one way or another, or can it, or has enough experience in their own lives, you know, with other people who are dealing with, who've dealt with trauma, uh, to tell it an authentic story. Um, you know, we always welcome, we, we view, uh, you know, filmmaking and, you know, making the TV series, a, a true collaboration from beginning to end. Um, so when you bring up something like, you know, Tamlin and what was going on with that, um, you know, we, when we had our initial conversations with her, um, it was us saying to her, it's important to us that what we're doing feels authentic because we knew of her ties to Okinawa. And we said, please, like, you know, when you're reading the script and um, when, when you're reading this character specifically, um, please tell us anything that you think uh, doesn't read authentic to you or that you think uh, can be additive on your end. And she was happy to do so. And, you know, same thing, the, the, the thing with her that was really fun was how the big surprise was when she brought um, some set design with her. That was something that like, you know, we, we in, the, in the writing process, we talked about things and we said like, okay, like when we're making this, we want this to be as authentic as possible. When we're talking to our production design team, we're talking about that stuff, but for her to, you know, go out of her own way to bring, you know, things from her own personal uh, collection and, you know, maybe gathering things from friends and, and stuff to bring them in case we wanted to use them. It was, it was truly special. Um, but, you know, back to the PT PTSD storyline, that was, you know, we, we felt for the Samantha character that we wanted to, uh, you know, A, be realistic and, and delve into the story in a different kind of way and see Samantha in a different kind of light. You know, if you're a, a teenage girl and you get into a fight like she did in the high school, it's not a, it's, it's a um, traumatizing thing and mm -hmm. can, and uh, we wanted to add some true nuance to it. And I think, uh, you know, it, hopefully it was reflected in the writing and certainly was in Mary's performance. Uh, my last question, and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, but having Elizabeth Shue come back to play Allie Mills, uh, was it difficult to to get her like with her schedule? Because I know that she was supposed to film a pilot around the same time you guys were filming season three. It was we we reached out to her, you know, far in advance of of her showing up in season three. You know, we we had actually been talking to her um, before and during when we were in production on uh, season two. Um, and, you know, we were kind of plotting out where it was going. So there was a, there was a long runway. You know, that's, that's one of when I've said, you know, we've talked with characters a year or more, um, you know, with performers a year or more before they may have appeared on screen. We were actually in touch, you know, with her to a degree um, you know, through others in season one, you know, to get her permission to use, um, you know, images and, and anytime you show a, um, you know, a moving image or a still image of, uh, of a performer from the original franchise, there has to be some, you know, agreement and sign off and, and licensing. Um, so that, you know, began the, the dialogue. Uh, we sat down and, and had uh, dinner with her, you know, during the season two timeline. But then it was really as we were, you know, entering season three that we knew, you know, we are taking it to this place. We want to, we want her arrival to be like a, you know, like a Mack truck through a wall. It should catch us all off guard. And, you know, it's, it's in the ether We're we're hearing things, but we're kind of forgetting about it. It's kind of fading into the background. It's kind of taking place only, you know, over a laptop and a phone. Um, but then when she shows up on screen, it's boom, there she is. And, um, and she was, you know, really into the, the creative and it was, it was up to the powers that be at, at YouTube um, and Sony at the time to, to make it happen and make it work. And there, there were schedules, there were, um, you know, there was a lot to figure out. Um, and it was one of those moments where we, we didn't really have a safety net story-wise that we were comfortable with. Um, so, you know, we just kept pushing the, the studio network to, to, you know, to please make this happen because the alternative was just not going to be as satisfying. Um, and it's, it's just one of those magical things that did work out exactly when it needed to work out um, to happen. And, uh, and our experience with her on set and her experience with ours, I think was, was better than any of us could have ever imagined in terms of having all the feels of, um, of the movie, 
all the feels of reconnection between, you know, actually, you know, Lisa and, you know, Ralph and Billy and, you know, Ali and Daniel and Johnny. Uh, it was all kind of happening in real time. It was all filming, you know, pretty much in sequence uh, where there weren't days down in between these things. It was like, we're filming this and we're filming this. And it's, you felt over the course of that week that it was, you know, this, it was becoming more heartfelt. It was becoming more organic. It was becoming more real. Um, and it was, it was just really amazing to see it come together. Um, but, but yeah, there was, there was a lot of personal connection and, um, and back channel talk that, that went um, into making sure that that happened. And yeah, one, 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 I was just gonna say one really special moment that I think about from that experience, and there's so many, was, uh, you know, when, when Daniel and Ali say goodbye to one another, that was a very emotional experience for both Lisa and for Ralph, because it was like uh, everything had come full circle in sort of their relationship and for Lisa with the franchise, you know, the, uh, she was such a huge part of the Karate Kid and then you know, how she was written off in Karate Kid 2 was not mm -hmm. something that she loved. And that like, you know, that there were there were some, you know, feelings over the years of, you know, the the disappointment in that and the frustration of that. And, you know, Ralph and she had not seen each other in a very, very long time. And when they did see each other, I happened, I was lucky enough to be there the first moment that they saw each other in like 35 years. And their faces both just lit up and it was like, oh my God. Like, I remember I think she said, oh my God. And Ralph like was started laughing because it was just like, you're in front of me right now. Like we've had this huge distance. And by the time we were shooting their goodbye scene, what you see on camera is very similar to the affection that they felt uh, for each other through the experience they had that week and all the history they had together. And I remember her saying that she had forgotten just how comfortable and uh, like the chemistry that they have on screen and working together and how wonderful it was. Um, you know, it was so long ago and just like instantaneously it was back. Uh, and, and my final question, you know, it, it's about that same scene and speaking of it developing organically and the emotions of the actors. Um, first time in 36 years, we hear Johnny say Danny. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was, was a, a huge thing. So was that, I mean, that was written that way, that developed that way. It just felt like that's when he would have done it. Yeah, it was uh, the immediate effect of kind of coming to terms and seeing this, um, you know, this Helen of Troy who came between them, um, giving them a little bit of the tough love and, you know, setting them on a path of, you know, maybe reconciliation it's the the immediate, you know, moments later, little nugget of is there a softening of the of the sharp edge there? Yeah, it 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 made a lot of people scream. We've been waiting for the D word for a very long time. <laughs> a big We're D. glad it delivered. Yes. Yeah. Well, that um, unfortunately our time has, uh, has has run out. I want to thank you guys so much for coming on the show. It's, it's always a pleasure to speak with you. I, I feel like we can talk for like five hours. Uh, obviously, we, but, we um, probably could, we probably could too. Unfortunately, we got to get yeah. back to work. Maybe, maybe right. one day we'll find that time. But um, exactly, <laughs> I so run out again. of coffee. I got to get more. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah. Th thanks again, you guys. Uh, we'll definitely talk again soon. I want to thank uh, all the listeners for for tuning in. All the, everything's in the show notes. You guys probably already have these guys on notification on other social media, so we won't get into that. We'll just uh, go ahead and end the episode. And uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you guys. Bye.